morning, if you will, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We're moving out of our normal series as we're walking through the book of Romans. The last several weeks, have been speaking on the wrath of God. God being an awesome God that he is, also walks in wrath of this. We've been looking at that for several weeks, and we'll pick back up again after the New Year's. But this morning, I'd like for us to read from the Christmas narrative, the birth of Jesus Christ. The Son of God. So turn with me to Luke chapter 2 this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 20. Have I ever told you how much I love Christmas? I do. I've shared it every year. This is my favorite time of year. I love it when the weather changes. I love getting to, to decorate. I love the opportunity to, to buy gifts and to get gifts. I really do love Christmas. But I want to remind us this morning that Christmas is all about God giving us the greatest gift ever. Amen. As God demonstrated the power of his love through his son, Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us that Jesus, inside the will of the Father, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Churches, I think about the fact that God gave us his only son, Jesus Christ, knowing that I deserve absolutely none of that. I begin to look through Scripture looking for different attributes to describe and understand God. And I know no attribute truly gives him the word that he's due but this morning. I want to attempt it. The word of God describes Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is of the tribe of Judah. He is the Rose of Sharon, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the Word of God become flesh. Church, he is Savior of the world. He is my Savior this morning. Is he yours? Jesus Christ came in this world, born in a manger. The most bizarre, the most humble of circumstances, as Jesus was born in a place that they kept animals for those who were staying in the inn. Absolutely no one knew what was taking place that night. No one understood the significance of that evening, apart from a virgin girl and an obedient single man. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20 says, An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. God sent us his very best in his one and only son, Jesus Christ, for the sole purpose of salvation. And church, I want to remind you, it is our salvation that Jesus Christ came for. What a very special Christmas morning. So if you have your finger held there at Luke chapter 2, let's read that Christmas narrative here this morning, picking up in verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem, and see this thing that has come to us, which the Lord has made known to us. Verse 16. Then they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known that saying which is told them by, uh, concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorified and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, and that which was told them. I repeat verse 11. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you this morning, this beautiful Sunday morning, in a time that we have together in worship. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. 
We thank you that he came for that sole purpose to bring salvation for my life. Lord God, for the life of all. God, I pray this morning that you would give me strength to proclaim this truth inside your word. God, open our ears to hear. Give us understanding and open our eyes to see. God, draw us near unto you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, this morning I would like to share with you uh, several things that just, they stand out to me immediately as I look at this Christmas narrative, understanding how quickly and how easily they apply to my life and into yours. So if you look in your bulletin this morning, you'll notice point number one. I want us to look at the person that God uses. Who God uses. If we look inside this passage, we'll see who God uses here. But I want to remind us this morning who God uses right here at Bethel Baptist Church. Who God uses, verses 8 through 10. It says, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Church, who was it that God chose to use to announce this great news to? Who was it that God chose to stand before this manger? Who was it that God chose to come and bow down that first Christmas morning? No one more, no one less than a group of shepherds. Of all the people in the world, God chose a group of shepherds. Who were these shepherds? I want to give a, a quick description this morning. A shepherd was near the bottom of the social ladder of the day. They were very uneducated, very unskilled people. According to New Testament times, they were viewed as dishonest men. Very unreliable. So much so, did you know that they were not even allowed into a courtroom to testify? The world saw shepherds as nobodies, as nothings. Their job of shepherding consisted of working in the fields seven days a week. This kept them from being able to come back into town itself in order to fulfill the man-made Sabbath regulations set by the Pharisees. So what did that mean? They were ceremonially unclean. When the world looked at shepherds, they saw men that were no good, dirty sinners. Isaiah 61, verse 1. This is Jesus speaking. He says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to who, church? The poor. He has sent me to heal who? The brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The day of the vengeance of our God. To comfort who? All who mourn. To console those who, console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. I want to remind us this morning, Jesus came for the unworthy. Jesus came for the purpose of saving sinners, church, for the hurting, for the destitute, for the broken and for the needy, for those who are bound, for those who need to be set free. Jesus came for the no good, dirty sinners like me and you. We look back at these shepherds and say that they were, but I remind you this morning, as Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. I am the most unworthy of all when I look at my own life. Jesus showed this truth this morning as he called out this group of unworthy men who were doing nothing more, nothing less than standing out in a field watching sheep. But what were these men doing? They were looking for the Messiah. These men recognized that they had a need inside their life, therefore they were looking for the Messiah. Look what the angel said to them in verse 10. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you I bring you good tidings of great joy. The message that was brought by these angels was one of truth, bearing good news. Not a word of judgment, but a word of truth, a declaration of hope. And he chose to give it to a group of men that the world said was unworthy. They did not deserve it. This morning, if I stop and look at my life, if you stop and look at your life, church is so easy to look in the mirror and say, how could God use me? I don't have that education. I wasn't growing up in a church. I don't know the Bible as well as others do. I want to remind you, God doesn't look for those who are educated. 
God doesn't look for the one that the world says is worthy. He doesn't even look for the one that looks in the mirror and says, I can be used. God looks for the one that has not, that he might raise them up, that he might receive the glory. This morning, if you're looking in the mirror and you're saying, God can never use me, then he's calling you. God wants to use you. He wants to place his hand upon you, and he wants to raise you up. He wants to put a word in your mouth. This morning, I ask you this question. Are you ready to be used for the name of Jesus Christ? Because just as he called these shepherds that first Christmas morning, this morning, I believe with all my heart, he's calling you. Number two, the second thing I want us to notice inside this Christmas narrative is who the good news is for. I want us to recognize and realize who this good news is for, found again in verse 10. The angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to who, church? All people. The good news that this angel is proclaiming good news to is for all. It's for everyone. Every man, every woman, every child who has ever been, who is, or who will ever be. Do you know what the Greek word for all is? All. Let's get a little bit, a little bit more deep. Do you know what the Hebrew word for all is? All. Let's not be confused this morning with the word of God is telling us. This good news that the angels are proclaiming is for every person. While praising God, after seeing baby Jesus in the temple, Simeon himself cried out in Luke chapter 2, verse 30, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the faces of who? All peoples. Verse 32, A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and to the glory of your people Israel. God's good news is for all people. He sent Jesus Christ to be that means of, uh, means of reconciliation to bring all who are lost to that place of right standing before Almighty God. Luke 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. All that is lost. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ reconciling who, church? The world. Rick, you know why he sent you to the Sudan? Because it's inside the world. You know why he sent me a chancellor? Because it's inside the world. As I look at him, I see some of our military personnel this morning. You know why he sends you out as he does? Because he's equipping us, he's preparing us, and he's sending us out to the world to do what? To bring the good news of Jesus Christ. Because he died for all. Not just for me, not just for you, but Jesus Christ came bringing salvation for all. It's by nothing of our own doing to make ourselves right before a holy God. It is by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And that's what I want to tie into right here this morning in point number three. Who, who the good news is about. I want us to stop and recognize who this good news is truly about. Because salvation was made possible for us. It was made possible by the life and the death of Jesus Christ. Verse 11. It says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Church, these angels proclaim that Jesus was the good news. Jesus was the hope that this world needed. Can I remind you something? Jesus is still the hope that this world needs today. Amen. As I watch the news every day and I watch the things that are taking place in this world that are around us, church, they need good news. This world needs good news and that good news is Jesus Christ. Do you believe me this morning? Amen. Then I'm going to ask us the same thing I've asked us three weeks in a row. When was the last time we told somebody? If we know that this is truth, we know that this is the word of God, this is what he's placed upon our lives, why are we not proclaiming that truth? Jesus is the hope that this world needs. It's Jesus and it's Jesus Christ alone. It's not Jesus plus. It's not Jesus and. It's Jesus and it's Jesus Christ alone. In a demonstration of his love, God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 5 verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I did not die for you. Your husband, your wife did not die for you. Muhammad did not die for you. Buddha did not die for you. Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for you this morning. The hope that this world needs came in a manger. And he came for the purpose of life and death, that we might have life everlasting. Jesus is our hope this morning, church. He is the good news. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other.
For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I love that song that we sing. Jesus. 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 There's something about that name. We haven't sang it in a while. We need to sing it again. Because church salvation is found in no other than the name Jesus Christ. That's the privilege by which we have. When I, I think about that message that was given to us this morning as uh, Brother Jimmy came in from Hill, uh, Hillcrest and, and, and Enterprise. And he was sharing the truth that each one of us, each one of us has received that call in our life. When we're called to the mission field, it doesn't automatically mean that we're called to the Sudan. Brother Rick, I'm, I'm thankful that God has sent you and he's called you to that place to proclaim the gospel. But for some of us, it's simply walking next door. It's simply knocking on the door and saying, I have the hope of Jesus. Do you know him today? It's simply walking into the, to the, the, the grocery store down the road. Walking into our workplaces and telling them that we have the hope of Jesus Christ, that they need their lives. Church salvation is found in no other name. It's Jesus, and it's Jesus alone. So I ask again, when was the last time we told someone? When was the last time we proclaimed that name? The message that we heard this morning was, how can they hear without a preacher? Do you know what a preacher is? It's not just me. A preacher is one who proclaims, one who tells. And that call is not just for me, but it's for each one of us this morning. What a glorious gift we could give back to our Savior today. In obedience to that call that he's placed on my life and that he's placed on yours. That each and every day we walk through our lives in obedience, proclaiming, telling that name Jesus Christ. Church, sometimes it's not in the act of kindness. We give ourselves to the one that has need. Sometimes we call that on our knees before Almighty God. We're praying for our brothers and our sisters. And sometimes it is going to knock on that door and sharing the good news. But my question this morning is, how is he calling you? How does he want to use you? Because there is salvation found in no other but the name Jesus Christ. The fourth and the final thing I want us to notice this morning is this. I want us to notice what the good news is for. Coming from verses 13 and 14. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Church, can there be peace today? As we read the books of prophecy, all the way to the book of Revelation, knowing the times that we're in today, can there be peace on this earth? Goodwill toward men? Can I remind you this morning that peace and goodwill is not found on the outside? It's found on the inside. It's found through a relationship with Jesus Christ. If we're looking for everything on the outside of this world just to slow down, calm down, and to become nice and beautiful, church, that's not going to be. Not until Jesus Christ himself comes back. But I can tell you this, even in the midst of the circumstances, through the midst of the trials, through everything that takes place, we can have peace inside of our lives when we know the one is sitting on the throne. When we know the one that's in control, the one that holds life itself, in his hands. Again, he says in verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heaven that goes praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Church, what is that goodwill? It is salvation in Jesus Christ. I believe with all my heart that no one truly wants to go to hell. But you know, I hear people say it all the time. Sadly, I hear it all the time. I hear individuals who say, It's all right, preacher. When I die, I'm going to bust hell wide open. And they just grin when they say it. Preacher, when I get there, we're going to party with all my friends. No, they won't. No, they won't. They have a failed understanding of what hell is really all about. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 50 gives a small description for all who fail to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. For those who fail to receive his forgiveness of their sins, it says they'll be cast into the furnace of fire where there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9 says such people will be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Luke chapter 16 gives a, a very clear picture of each person's personal torment. Listen to what's shared of the rich man in Luke 16 verse 24. He says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue. For I have this 
slain. But Abraham said to him, Son of man, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise, likewise, now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this between us and you, there's a great goal fixed. So those who pass here, you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Very quickly, I want us to know the different ways that those that are not found in Jesus Christ are judged. And you might say, Brother Dave, what does this have to do with Christmas? Stick with me. Notice this now. I want us to notice the different ways that those that are not found in Jesus Christ are judged. First of all, there will be a physical torment. There will be a physical torment. Listen to what the rich man says in verse 24. He says, Send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in that water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented inside this flame. Church, for those that fail to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there will be a physical torment inside their body for eternity. This is not a temporary fix, but this is a, uh, an eternal fix. As they fail to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there will be a physical torment. Second of all, there will be a mental torment. Notice what Abraham noted in verse 25. He said, Son, remember, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus his evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. For all eternity, those who fail to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, for all eternity, they will remember every opportunity they had to confess him they did not. They'll remember every person that walked in front of them and shared the name Christ. They'll remember every time they read the name Jesus Christ. They might remember every time they walked in a church service just like this and they did not respond. For all eternity, there will be a mental torment. Thirdly, I want us to notice that there will be a spiritual torment. Look what Abraham shared in verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. For eternity, they will realize that they are separated from Almighty God. <laughs> Spiritually, church, they will understand for eternity, they will never face and see the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. They'll never be forgiven. Why? Because they had their opportunity and they failed to respond. Church, there will be a judgment for those who fail to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But I want to remind us this morning that there is a good news. And that is that we do not have to. We do not have to stand on that day of judgment. We do not have to stand on that day of wrath. Because God sent his only son. 1 John chapter 4 verse 9 says, In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the covering for our sins. Church, that's what Christmas is all about. The fact that I can fall down before Almighty God of no doing it my own, but receiving the gift that he has given me and his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus came as a little baby in a manger. But he came for the purpose of living and dying for me and for you. All we have to do is confess Him as Lord and Savior. Repent of our sins. Acknowledge the fact that we have sinned before Almighty God. Receive His salvation and surrender our lives to Him to live for Him every single day. Church, that's the true story of Christmas. The greatest gift of all. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Have you received Him this morning? Have you received the greatest gift of all time? The gift of Jesus Christ? Have you allowed him to forgive you of your sins? Have you allowed him to give you new life? Life that is eternal? So when we stand before him and he says, why should I allow you into my heaven? I can bow down before him and say, not because of any doing of my own, but because of your son, Jesus Christ. In church, one of the words you'll hear, enter in, my child, well done, my good and faithful servant. If you have received the greatest gift of all. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes?